Today we have actor, director, writer and musician, John Capilos. Um, I was at church once and this lady came up to me. She says, you're a bad person. You play <laughs> bad people. No one's like... What did I do? <laughs> you know what I mean? And sometimes people are disappointed hmm. when you're not that guy. Right. You know, that guy in the movie or like you're that jerk or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the killer or the sarcastic uh, janitor. <laughs> right. I once got in a car with a friend of mine and I just played a killer in a movie and the guy had seen me in the movie goes, oh my God, it's a killer in my cab. No, that dates it. <laughs> There are no cabs anymore, but... And you... So, is there any part that you played where you could see your own personality within that role? You know, um, I'm going to say something now that probably, you know, people, writers will hate, but there, there are very few parts that I've read that have the depth or width or interesting aspects of who I am sometimes. I mean, um... And that's what happens when you get known to be a character actor, because I'm not really particularly fond of that expression. I think all actors do stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes you just, you know, like, really, I just have to play that guy, that note? <laughs> um, so to go back to your question, there have been a few parts. I did a movie called The Deep End of the Ocean with Michelle Pfeiffer, and it was directed by a wonderful director named Ulu Grosbard. And it was uh, taken from a book by Jacqueline Mitchard. Um, it was, I guess, when Oprah had a book club back in the day, and uh, it was one of her big books at early, and, and it sort of made it big. And I played this father who uh, my wife had a child, and then she dies, and then it was her stepchild, she told me, and then I realized that she'd taken the child. <gasps> and then I had to give the child back to Michelle Pfeiffer and Treat Williams, lovely guy, sorry that he passed away. Mm. Um, and it, it was a part that had a lot of depth and, 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 and I could use a lot of who I am in it and that was really good I could play sort of the more subdued, sensitive, emotional side yeah um, well, you being know. a husband and a father as well yeah right and also losing you know being in a situation where you were, you know, I mean, it's a horrible situation to be in. The man was married to a woman who said, this is my child. And then she dies, and he realizes that she stole the kid. Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Heart-wrenching, really, isn't it? And, and, uh, and, and when, it's, when he realizes it's true, he also, because he's a morally good person, he has to give the child back. But, um... So, oh, you know... What a, uh, I, I'm going to watch that movie. I know I'm going to be... I'll have to get my tissues out because I cry at commercials. <laughs> it's a good movie. And, and, you know, it's a shame that Michelle's company, which produced the movie, didn't get to do more. A lot of um, actors have their own companies and they get to produce stuff. Um, and then some of these times these companies fail because their product either doesn't work or, you know, they didn't have enough success. And then they... Uh, but... She was wonderful, wonderful, A, to work with, and B, right. as a producer. Um, and again, Treat Williams, you know, was in it. Treat was good guy. I met him back in the 80s. But. How has music influenced your life? Well, I mean, you know, um, I'm a musical person by nature. I took uh, piano lessons for eight long years when I was a kid um, from an English woman. Well, English Canadian Winifred Reeves was my teacher, but her she was an aficionado of this person. But anyway, um, I had a very dear friend of mine growing up who was an incredible guitar player, and I realized in my late teens that I wanted to be a musician. But I then I realized when I did plays that actually acting sort of trumped it. Right. And when I saw how good a musician he was. I realized I could probably be a better actor than musician. <laughs> <laughs> so I made that choice, uh, yeah. Gamble. And then I continued with my music. And, and then at Second City in Chicago, when I was in the theater, I used a lot of music to do parody and things like that. So I realized that I could use employ music in a different way, that I wasn't maybe going to be as skilled a composer. Mm -hmm. But then as I got into my older years, um, I figured, well, I wanted to reapproach this. 
So I've actually done three albums, Sam, but yes, only one is available now. I pulled the other two out, knowing you know how you know great artists pull them out because they only make them more you know, rare. <laughs> Where can people uh, go listen to your music, you on? Well, they can get it on Spotify. Spotify. Um, they can get it on Spotify, iTunes, all those places. The name of the album is Too Hip for the Room. This is my album, Too Hip for the Room. Here we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Too Hip so, for I mean, the Room. It's available. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, a labor, it was a labor of love. It's still, I think, a great album. See, I like, I mean, it, it's nice to listen to it in its entirety, but you can, of course, listen to the tunes. Your music, I've listened to it, it's quite, like, soulful, isn't it? I hope. I mean, it's a little bit funny and ironic. Mm -hmm. It's not, When I was a kid, they used to have these, you know, they're coming to take me away, ha, ha, ho, ho, he, he. You know, you know like, novelty songs yeah. on the radio, and, and people would put out comedy records. And, like, I like the occasional comedy record, you know, and... And novelty songs, particularly, like you know, and I think the modern day version of it would be like the sort of the weird Al Yankovic thing, is that they're okay to listen to for maybe one, two times. Then, then they're okay, funny, haha, I've heard it. But the thing is that those are when people take songs and then change the lyrics, for example. Right. But then they can do lyrics to it and you know, change the words to beat it or something like. Uh, and that's Yankovic's sort of shtick, which is, you know, he's done very, very well. Um, no flies on him, but I prefer to do songs that are a little bit more ironic, funny, and then you listen to them, oh, wait a minute, what's he saying there? There's a song called I Wish I Was Married to Your Wife, right. um, which is um, which is funny, ha-ha, but right. there are songs that are a little bit more subtle, and, you know, and then there are songs that are not as subtle. So I sort of have them... And, you know, jazzers, for the most part, Sam, do not like to uh, laugh at themselves. So it's, a, it's got a bit of a humorous edge, that the jazz the, world. The jazz. I like jazz, though. I, I like no, it. Yeah. I, 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 but I'm talking about jazz musicians or the jazz, you know, this, there's a serious side to the jazz world that they sometimes take themselves a little bit too seriously. You know, they can be very, you know, yeah. uh, in their head. When I was younger, I think people had a tendency to respect older people just because they were older. And I think that had a downside to it. But now as I'm older, I see that younger people have less respect for older people. Now, I don't want people to respect me just because I'm older, but I do think that people should understand the um, complexity of, of life and of aging. And I think the one thing we can improve on, particularly baby boomers, I wish... Baby boomers were a little bit more proactive about ageism. Because right. when I was a kid and you, they said nobody trusted anybody over 30, you know, like I was part of that sort of, you know, baby boom generation. And now that I'm way over 30, I think it's about time we sort of made people a bit more aware that aging is a, a bit more of a subtle practice and we shouldn't vilify people for just being old or just aging, you know? Right. It's, stu it's stupid. Yeah. And it's also, it's just as stupid to say, The well, respect's gone, John. We used to have a lot of respect for our elders. You'd respect your elders. And then these days, it seems to, um, and, I, I, and I think it's, it's what we teach our children, right? So if we, yeah, we don't teach our children to respect the elders, then we're not going I also, to. Also, but, but right? what I'm also saying is, is widening it out a little bit more, Sam, is that I just think that we're not respecting each other enough. Right. Yeah. Elders, youngers, yeah, I would start with elders. You know, stop vilifying people just because they limp or walk slower. Right. You know, the first time I really saw it, Sam, was when my mom got sick. And I took her on a trip to a wedding. It was the last trip she took out, outside of Canada to her beloved United States. She loved the U.S. And I took her to a wedding, and she was in a wheelchair, and she was quite debilitated. And we took her on a plane, and I took her on a plane. And just seeing how people behave to people in wheelchairs. And if you've ever had the misfortune of being in a wheelchair, I have at an airport and stuff, just the way people literally look down at you. You right. know, sort of, you know, and... And yet, yes. and yet they, they're, you know, they're just, I mean, they're going to look the same as a disabled person that's just come back from war. Um, 
and missing a leg. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, there's just you there's just. Respect. I also think as an actor, when I look at people who study behavior, I often think that people don't realize how much information they're giving away on their effing faces. Hmm. People think they're just being impassive, but in actual fact, even in their impassivity, people are giving away so much, particularly when it's revulsion or, you know, that... You know, and, and you, having grown up in England, I must say, the English have 50 ways of putting you down without saying a word. <laughs> they, 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 and, you know, from the shopkeeper at the, the, shopkeeper the Harris, Irish too. <laughs> that's the cheese, uh, so to speak. Um, you know, the shopkeepers are the ones that, I actually think the lower classes hold the class system in place high, because they, they have more at stake than the upper classes. Right. Yeah. If, if the system crumbles, they're the ones that are going to be crushed. Well, it, but, it is. It goes from the poor up, doesn't it? <laughs> the, the ones I mean, that are poorer have... The poorer people have more to lose because well, they, they, they value know. so much of what they've got. I mean, I don't know how profane I can get on your show here. But you, it's uncensored. You can do what you want. A friend of mine said... <laughs> Apart from running around naked. <laughs> a friend of mine said when I was in Ireland, he said... I mean, basically, if you want to, if you want to screw an Irish girl, you know, she's going to humiliate you for sixty odd hours, and then maybe you've got a wee bit of a chance. <laughs> <laughs> but after you bought her a few drinks, <laughs> yeah, and then forget it. You know, she's yeah. just going to be. They're like the Italians, though. It's like you've got no chance. It's like it's it's a sin. <laughs> but you know, in the eighties, maybe. <laughs> well, you know, Greek girls. I mean, you have to show them their dowry, and then you know, talk to their four yes, brothers before. Yes, they're very respect beautiful absolutely beautiful the ladies and the gents there so huge respect for the greek people so my grandfather's has said serbian so serbian are greek and mongolian um generation mongolian mm -hmm. mongolian and greek is my grandfather's ancestors Mongols. Because this and the and again, nation. Now, I don't want to mess with you in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> I think you've added Mongol into Irish and Serbian. Mm. And Greek. Greek, Mongolian, and Irish. And my mom's family is the Black Irish, so they're Spanish. I think Mongolian or Macedonian? Mongolian. They invaded in Greece, right? So the Mongolians invaded Greece. Um, and then the Mon Serbians the generated from there. And the Croatians was Greek and German. Are you sure Mongolians are massive? I, I'm not yep. reading your reading on that one. Mongolians? Mm -hmm. Like Way China? back when. Oh, well, I mean, that's before my time. It's before, before mine my... as well, John. That's what my dad says anyway. So, yeah, so. Well, I've got to believe what he, what he said, right? Well, yeah. I have to really, don't I? He's a history buff. He knows his stuff. So, and I'm not, I love history, but he knows his stuff. He knows everything. Is there anybody you particularly really like to work with? Well, I mean, I loved working with Steve Martin and I would love to work with him again. Um, I had a lot of Second City people I really enjoyed working with. Um, uh, there are just too many to mention, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. you know, I worked with some a great actor is Dan Castellaneta, and who's the voice of Homer Simpson now. He was actually my, uh, I think, one of my understudies at Second City. Wonderful oh, wow. actor. And um, there are, you know, the, the one, of the good thing about acting is you get to get to have an opportunity. You know, like I worked with Michelle Pfeiffer, as I said, and right. and um, um. Richard Gere, when I did the movie uh, Internal Affairs, right. was a real delight and just a, a subtle, subtle actor. You know, not not your Daniel Day Lewis, not somebody that does really radically different things, but very sort of subtle shifts. Right. Character. Um. I don't know. I mean, there there are lots of uh, cool actors. Uh, you know, I'd like to work with more um, English actors. Mm-hmm. I worked with uh, Hugh Laurie on House. 
and he wouldn't drop his uh, American accent during the whole thing, which is disappointing because I wanted to hear him speak as Hugh Laurie. But. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard to do accents. I can't do an American accent. Well, as you can see, I just did a, a terrible Irish accent. But I can, do, <laughs> I can do There are certain accents I can do. Right. And there are certain actors that just can't do an accent and then get out of it. Because when I did um, Days of Our Lives, I played this Greek guy and he had a very heavy Greek accent that I could do like this. But, I mean, that that is something I can do quite easily because right. it sort of comes from my ethnic history. Absolutely. If there was a charity that you could advocate for, not necessarily donate, but advocate, what would that be and why? Um, it would be muscular dystrophy and myotonic dystrophy. We have um, my cousin's son. His son is now 22 years old, and when he was born, he was born with the inability to make any muscle mass. Oh. So he has what's called myotonic dystrophy. And um, parents, when he was born, were essentially told, you know, walk away, give up hope, there's nothing you can do. And he's not going to live beyond the age of whatever, two or three years of age, if. And now, that, as I said, the, the, the boy is 22. And um, he still has, the, he doesn't have the ability to make muscle or to speak, but he has, they put a, they've straightened his spine, he's productive, he's going to live a life. Um, so we have, as a family, have supported that uh, myotonic dystrophy, but it's also a pernicious, pernicious thing. People mm. are, uh, muscular dystrophy people are aware of. It's the same sort of thing. What happens with muscular dystrophy is people are born with the ability to move and stuff, and then they lose it because the myelin around their their nerves uh, gets right. destroyed. And they use the, lose the ability to be come shame. Over. So anyway, that's a. I mean, I'm telling you, Sam, when you see this kid, um, kid now he's you know as I said, 22, right. just turned. You know, it's, it, my money. My mother used to say, if you, if you took out your troubles, like if you took, if everybody's troubles were like garbage and took them out in the street and took a look at everybody else's troubles, you'd take your own garbage back into the house. Right. I've heard that before. And it's so true, isn't it? I mean, when you see what other people have to deal with, my goodness. And he is such a... Lovely. I mean, you know, it puts people like me to shame in terms of like, boy, I don't know whether I could be that strong. When I was a teenager, there's something about me, and sometimes I think I could be a you know, rocket scientist. I'm not, I couldn't. So that's what the actor in me. So when I was, a, before I became an actor, as a teenager, I thought I could, I wanted to work with um, disabled kids and people that were special needs. In those days, they called it different names, mm -hmm. but better names today. So my mother knew somebody that worked with disabled children. So I went to work one afternoon in the summer and uh, one, one morning. And um, I would go into the bathroom, restroom, washroom, as they say in Canada, the WC, and uh, would like every 45 minutes and just cry, right? Mm. Just, and then come back out. And finally, my mother's friend who ran the thing, you know, with all these... And they, the kids were mostly my age, right? I was working with yeah. disabled kids. Um, she said, they don't need your pity, John. Go home. They, you can't handle this emotionally. She said, they don't need your pity. They need your strength. They don't want to see you crying and feeling sorry for them. So right. if that's not... You know, they don't need that. She mm -hmm. said, well, obviously... Uh, Sense of a kid, whatever. Find something you can do. Right. Can, you know. And um, I performed a lot when I was a teenager and then older in old folks' homes, of assisted living, and then also for kids and for special needs kids. Did a lot of that with Second City. We played a lot of. And it's tough audiences, blind audiences, deaf audiences. I played a lot of audiences with Second City. Oh, but but I tell you something. Uh, I love it, and I love it. And um, for me, that's a place to be emotionally. For me to perform for people like that, 
but it's very it's a tough thing for me to um you know as i said to to be um to deal with it right it's not oh, easy to see you, you no, see you, you're you're sensitive because in a way you value what you have and what they don't you what you can do walking talking and and, and you see that they can't and it, it is heartbreaking to see that for them. But they are living the best life they want to. And they actually have more courage than us, John, really, is when you think oh, about I, it. I, I agree. And I mean, and, you know, I, I am I'm quick, sometimes too quick with a tear. Me and, too. Um, Me too. <laughs> and, and, and I don't perceive that as a weakness. But no, I some don't. Other, others may. That's their thing. I think that's called empathy, John. Yeah, and I also think it's yeah, it is empathy, and I also think it's 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 the ability to 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 be able to to put yourself in another person's shoes. I mean, that's even a little bit more than empathy to to be able to put yourself in somebody's position. And I got a lot of that, I think, from my parents, particularly from my father. My father was a an empathetic individual. Yeah, me too, and and you are as well. You can, you usually know. People have an aura about them, right? Like, and, you know, I'm, and who I'm you sure can that, approach and who you can't. And you know, um, again, you know, there are people that you know one meets that are you know immediately <laughs> uh, not on that wavelength. You know, that mm -hmm. they don't standoffish. Mm. You know, yeah, it, it takes all to make a world, doesn't it? It's just acceptance of other people, boundaries, and who they are. I think. But also, but also, I think Sam, and and I think that when one gets older, I was in a situation once where I was in an audition when I was younger, and I saw another actor, and we started talking. And like, hey, yeah, I remember that movie we did and that play. We were really enthusiastic about seeing it, and we kept on saying, "Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. That was fun." That was fun. I remember going back to the audition sitting down and this older actor next to me, older meaning probably my age now, looked at me and he said with real disdain, he goes, well, I hope you guys think that acting and show business is all about having fun. Huh? I hope you guys have fun. And then he went back to his script and I thought to myself, what a bitter prick. What a bitter, bitter <laughs> Yeah, shame. Prick. He's taking away your thunder. And I, I'm at an audition a few years ago. This is when you'd be in a room. And I saw these two younger actors going, oh, isn't this fun? It was fun. Oh, I had this fun. And I was sitting there, and I looked at them going, all they think about is show business being fun. And then I caught myself. Going, oh, God. Am I that old guy sitting there? <laughs> the and I caught myself. Right. Because I was. I was the older actor in the corner watching these two young guys talking about how much fun they had doing this play and this. I, and wonder, I, what, I wonder what changes our perspective when we get older. And when I realized they haven't been through the mill and seen the shit that I've seen. Right. And, and, and realized that it's, yeah, it's still fun, but it's also work, guys. And it's also tough work, and you better be prepared for it to be not fun. Well, I think and, that. I think it's a very tough industry. It's not And easy. I think that that's what that other actor was thinking and saying. Hmm. But he didn't say it, and he said it in such a miserably unproductive way. Right. That I didn't understand his perspective, because he was an accomplished actor. He's dead now, but I keep on seeing him on TV. And he's good. Right. Like, so it's not like he goes away from my imagination. Or from my, from my, because in a way he had a point of view that was quite valuable, but he was such a, he was said it in such a. He, he could have not, put it. In, he could have put it in a better way, a better way, it, not it, so it, bitter. It didn't, it didn't work, right? And it's the first time I've actually articulated that story in a way to somebody as yourself that makes it make sense a bit, a bit more to me right now too. So. Right. Yeah, I can see. We, I mean, they say that, oh, they're... Perspective people, changes. But perspective you changes, be, yeah. You could be that young, idealistic person and become that bitter, embittered old person, and you could be the same person. It's what happened in between. I'm not... 
but I'm not embittered by nature. No. I mean, I, you know, I'm not one of these guys going, yeah, I didn't get that part. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, it was between me and Bruce Willis for Moonlighting, okay? Right. It was, we were the two actors, and it went to Bruce Willis, and then he, he had his career. Mm -hmm. I don't look at myself and go, wow, Bruce Willis, you know, I should have had his career. Because even if I got Moonlighting, I wouldn't have had Bruce Willis's career. And even, even if he didn't get Moonlighting, he still might have become Bruce Willis in a different way. Right. And so you can't, you can't second guess stuff. You can't say, oh, uh, I would have got the, the fast pass on that one. You know, right. you know I could have got Moonlighting and would have been canceled after one episode. You never know. <laughs> With Sybil Shepherd. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, you, you just don't know, right? Yeah. No, you know, I think with life, as we get older, we do have a different perspective because we've been through more, seen more, right. we've got more experience. You're actually, we actually should have more patience, but sometimes we have, it depends on the situation. We have less patience on some things, more patience on others. But I know one thing, when, when you came to that function, Merritt MacArthur, Sean McNabb, they were all in their awe seeing you. Merrick said he's admired you for years and I got some great photos of you and Merrick and the crowd and you and Tony and Tom Conkle and Vernon Wells. Oh, so, that was you, you know, to me, you were kind to everybody at the Comic-Cons. You do go to the Comic-Cons and well, you've got a good attitude, John. No complaints. Well, the, thing is, the thing is also, I mean, I also talk to, when you talk and interview people, see how they were, you know, early in their careers, if, if people were given a lot early in their careers, if the doors opened for them and things were kind of easy, sometimes they have difficulty adjusting later in their careers right. because the doors close and things change. And, you know, if you're a young pretty face, I mean, I sort of worked through the whole time for everything I've gotten. So the, nothing really ever came easily. You right. Know? So, um, and I think that there are certain performers, whether it's in music or wherever that early on they're okay, but they get better as they get, you know, and then there are certain people that they're great when they first start and then it just doesn't, the second album isn't as good and the third and right. then something happens and then they, you know, it's like I'd rather be the actor that, or the performer or the artist that opens out, gets better with age. Right. And I think if you don't learn from your mistakes or learn from your craft or learn, become better in certain ways then, you know. So um, working with the actor who, you know, is old and embittered, you know, never worked for me, even as a young actor. No. You know, it's like, gee, you know well, being no, around those. I mean, because you're on set and you're on set. It's not a nine to five job. You're on set for hours and hours and hours with these people. And if someone's mean on set, then who wants to work with that? And have to go into work with them every day. For hours and then for months. The thing that I've no. learned over time is that, you know, there are people that think they're expendable. Mm. Um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe Keith Richards and Mick Jagger are expendable. But, you know, um, there may be, a, well, but everybody's expendable. You know what I mean? I mean, in, in, act, in the acting world, you know, there are actors I worked with in the 80s and 90s that thought that, I mean, big name actors, a couple of them, and that, that I could mention their names today and you wouldn't know who they are. You just wouldn't. And I'm not going to embarrass them by mentioning their names. Right, yeah. But, but at that time, man, you know, untouchable, right? Yeah. In, either in the world of comedy. And I'm not going to put them, I wasn't thinking about this person, but if you mention Chris Farley or Jim, John Belushi's name to people nowadays, people don't know who they are for the most part. I know who John Belushi is. Yeah, but you're a little, you know, but... But, but anybody, I'm older. <laughs> yeah. Anybody over under 25 or 30, they don't know. Yeah, true. And why would they? Chris Farley, maybe, you know? It's funny because in the olden days, the old actresses, Ginger Rogers, Marion Monroe, they're iconic. Yeah, well, I mean... Bing people Cosby. People Monroe is, I don't know if people, you know, I mean... If you were to say to 30 people if they know Ginger Rogers was, um, I, I would venture guess that you'd get under 50%. Probably, yeah. But Marilyn Monroe, you'd probably get, you know. It's because she's more famous yeah. when she died. She's She was very famous, but because she died, that makes you more famous. Isn't that strange? 
Yeah, but I mean, um, Jane Mansfield died in 1963, and I would imagine people won't, won't you know, and she died tragically, she was a bit, but if you were to do a name check on Jane Mansfield today, I would mm-hmm. imagine uh, people, she wouldn't reach the 50% barrier. True. The thing about Marilyn Monroe is not only did she die, but she kept, her balloon kept on being hit up in the air every 10, 15 years with new books and new fascinations. Right. This, and not to mention, you know, her killer body and something like it hot. I mean, when you see a movie like that, you go, wow. Beautiful, I mean, absolutely. Generations, beautiful. generations of adolescents are still, like, you know, in love with her. Yeah. I think the main, the main thing in life is to exactly. be kind. It's, it's not what you do, it's how you treat other people. And I think I'd rather be known for that than anything else. There are people, though, that are really, really notorious for being bad to people. Yeah. That have a lot of fame because of that. Well, they, they can live with that. The problem is that a lot of bad behavior has been historically either rewarded, uh, tolerated, or even, um, in, in a sense, sort of um, encouraged, you know, from certain people. The term is turned on that in a lot of ways. I'm hoping, yeah. but um, the, the the thing is, when you show up in a film set and you're working with an actor who's who's either very temperamental or or has some sort of drug and alcohol issue, and brings it to the set, that can be excruciating, you know. Right. And, and there's very little tolerance, I think, for um, stuff like particularly when actors today um, are really like, you know, hostile and, and, and moody. I'm just talking about uh, for no other reason except they have a they have a bad temper or they don't know how to deal with people in a way that's that's decent. And like I have no respect for that, man. Mm. Um because you know um You go and tell him, John. Well I mean you're seeing when you see people who have good sides to them, you can also see that, you know, I can be, because I, I'm a pretty damn good actor, I can be a pretty miserable person too. And if somebody chooses not to be nice to me, then I can choose not to be nice to them. Right. But in, in doing so, it's not like I'm going to be miserable to them. I just don't give them the time of day, right. period. Just do your job and then out. <laughs> well, I mean, and I grew up with, I mean, I grew up with a couple. My mother had a sister who was a piece of work. And she's not worth talking about. But her whole shtick was ignoring you. So I grew up with an aunt that I could be in the room and she could literally not see me. And I was like, really? <laughs> and when you grow up with somebody I'm sorry. like that. Yeah, but then I can, you know, okay, that's a shtick that I can put on if I have That's to. passive aggressive behavior, John. It's the worst. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't her, like the silent treatment. She died, and like a smile went across my face, and I thought to myself, <laughs> not everybody that dies <laughs> is necessarily a sad story. John Capilos, you bad boy. <laughs> I think we should end on that note, Sam. No, we should end on. Um, if this was the last time you were ever going to speak, the last chance, the last moment, what would you say? I'll just enjoy it all and realize it goes too goddamn fast. I like that. Short and sweet and precise. Just enjoy it all. Enjoy life. And and where can people find you, John? Um, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram. I'm the John Kapilos on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I'm I've got John Kapilos page, John Kapilos news on uh, Facebook. Please say hi. And music, yes. And also, you're at the Comic Cons. I don't know if you'll be going to any more next year, but we have seen. I you hope. At the I Cons. hope. I mean, you know, so if, you have- if, they'll, if they'll let me in. They'll let you in. Hey, let's go bang down them doors. <laughs> John Kapilos, I will be in touch with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. Thank on- you. I'm glad we. Finally got around to doing the same. I know. Well, we've both been very busy. 
But thank you so much for being on Chatbox with Sam. It was an honour and a pleasure to know you. It's an honour and a pleasure to speak with you. And I'm very, very grateful for you being on season four. Thank you, sweetie. Stay tuned for the sneak peek from next week's episode with Yulia Udina. Today we have the actress, Yulia Udina. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We were at the um, Prey of Wrath screening because Yulia with Benny Tahandra, Cynthia Rothrock. Benny actually wanted to cast me as a girlfriend of one of the main characters. I switched my hair color because the project was freeze for a while. And when he saw me with dark hair, he was like, oh my God, Julia, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so originally I'm from Russia and yes. of course I was trained with method by Stanislavski and all my teachers were like, there's almost his students and they're almost like 200 years old. And of course, like they have all this old fashioned uh, techniques. And I like to go in this method so deep that some of these transitions with the characters happen in my life. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I really appreciated that the universe gave me this soldier character I because know. I'm not with him. And I, in the end of this, my, my dying scene, yes. I, I, I know she you. killed you. <laughs> oh my God, I was tortured. That was like, that was another story. That's why I'm, I love Los Angeles and I love the United States because it gives us opportunity to know other cultures, not to just to be acquainted like a tourist and to see the facade, but just go deeper. Why this person did that? Like why we have that and this, how I can communicate, where is our connection? Mm -hmm. I wish Benny's prayer of wrath will go to Sanders, but I'm just bringing it to the news. <laughs>